my name is Tom Webster, and I'm at Kentucky State University. This is going to be a presentation without slides, okay? <laughs> it was going to, yeah. so, and I turned the lights on, so there's no excuse for falling asleep here. Um, we're going to talk about observation beehives, which has always been one of my fascinations since I first got into bees. I've been a big fan of it. Um, in fact, there is a book, which I mentioned at the bottom of the handout here, which is for sale. I believe that some of the vendors have it, and certainly you can buy it from the vendors. It's a book I wrote with Dewey Karen called Observation Hives, and it was written um, about 15 years ago. It's, it's one of the things in bees that doesn't really go out of date very quickly. Um, some other subjects do go out of date fast, like things about mites and chemicals and, and so forth, but Observation Hives um, are, have been around for many, actually for centuries, um, the basic idea is pretty much the same, and um, there are not too many really new developments. So I think the booklet is, uh, is still quite valid. I would like to put together um, another sort of publication that would be new ideas in observation. Because there are a lot of things that are not covered in the booklet that I've thought of that could certainly be interesting. I'll talk a little bit about some of these things. Um, so. Observation hive is simply a hive, usually a small hive that has transparent sides. Now these, these hives, these sides are so transparent you can't even see them, okay? <laughs> and all the bees got out, so, um, but this actually is supposed to be either glass or plastic, you can choose. Um, and the first thing to understand is that um, need to be a little bit of a beekeeper first. You have to know the basics of beekeeping. You don't have to be a really good beekeeper, but you have to know the basics of opening a hive and manip manipulating the hive and, and that sort of thing. The second is I distinguish between um, the so-called portable observation hives, which are typically have a handle on the top and they're about one frame of bees and they'll have some bees and honey and so forth in there. And people oftentimes take those around to give presentations or if you go to the farmer's market or you go to the fair, and they're very good attention getters. Uh, people love to see the bees up close and, and uh, without having to worry about anything. It's very good for presentations to non-beekeepers or to the schoolroom and so forth. However, you don't really see the true beehive, a true bee colony biology in those things because they're cooped up, they can't fly, they're usually churning around in chaos. And what's really cool about bees is the very sophisticated behavior that they have, and that is not seen in these one framers that are portable. And of course, you don't see the foraging bees going in and coming out with pollen and so forth. You don't see that either because this is a hive that's all closed up. So what I'm gonna talk about actually is what you might call a stationary observation hive. And that's, um, of course, you've gotta have a place for it since it's stationary and think carefully about it. And there's a bunch of things, guidelines about this. Now I go through a lot of this in more detail in the, in the booklet that I wrote with Dewey Karen. So um, if you do buy that book, we'll have a lot of things. Even the dimensions of you want to build your own. You can see this is a homemade here. Um, <clears throat> people say that I hammer like lightning because I never strike twice in the same place. Okay, so that's sort of my philosophy of making stuff here. This is actually all held together with wood screws so that I can take it apart and modify it and, and put it back together one way or another. Um, now this is to hold, um, four deep frames, deep lengths, draw frames, which hang here and here and here and here, and there's a little bit of space up above. And then the bees, and of course there's the sides here. Glass is nice because it's so transparent, and it's, it's um, in a way it's more attractive, I think, in a lot of ways, and also I think you can clean it better than you can plastic. Plastic can easily get scratched. Uh, or a little bit cloudy, and if you get wax and propolis on it, it's kind of hard to clean it up. Glass, you can do a really nice job on. But of course, glass is uh, somewhat more breakable. You can buy the sort of safety glass if you're really into it. Um, it has the coating. It's like, it's like the stuff we have in our car windows. It's got a coating of plastic so that if the gla if glass does break, all the pieces of, of glass are kind of held in, in there. So it's, it's your choice. Um, Glass is a little bit heavier, and something to remember is if you're going to be lifting this and it's got four frames full of honey in it um, and bees and so forth, that's going to be kind of heavy, so think about that. I like four frames because it's kind of a compromise. Um, it's, it's not extremely heavy, and so a lot of people can lift this as they need to move it in and out of its location. Um, but um, 
it's it's not. Um, it's basically it's a small hive because it's only four frames, and we know our hives are basically going to be at least one deep with ten frames, oftentimes more boxes than that. So this is going to be a, a small colony, and it's always going to suffer somewhat because the bees can't grow um, their colony very much. They can't store a lot of food. Uh, it's probably not going to get through a cold winter like what we have around here. Uh, so there are special considerations about it. It's it's relatively um, relatively big as far as observation has go. I knew one guy who made a seven framer. Um, that's kind of a little bit extreme, but he managed it pretty well. Um, so think about the size. Now you can buy observation hives, the one framers, and some of them are designed so you can attach them to each other. If you don't want to make your own, you can attach them. And so you can stack them up three or four high if you want. So look, you can look into that, look at the beekeeping supply companies and, um, and see what's, what's possible for you. The mo if you do build it, the most important critical dimension is the, is the distance between the transparent sides, okay? It can't be too narrow or too wide. One and a half inches is just about right. Um, if it's too wide, anybody know what's gonna happen if you have too much space here? Burr home. home, right. If it's too narrow, then what? Yeah, the bees can't get in there very well, and um, they're just, yeah, there's all sorts of issues that it's going to be a problem. So they keep to that dimension. The other dimensions are not quite so critical. You can kind of play around with the system. And then what you have is you have a base here, and this is one of many designs. It's sort of the design I grew up with. And this is covered with plastic here. And then this is a, a runway for the bees to come down and go out, and they'll come down this way. And then you have another part, which is kind of like this, that attaches, <clears throat> and this is the part that goes out your window, because you're going to want to have this close to a window someplace. Um, some people go so far as to put a hole in the wall, but that's kind of extreme. Most people want to go with a window that can be opened either this way or vertically, and then you, design, you open the window enough so you can fit this through, and then you fill the gap in with a piece of plexiglass, for example, or whatever you, you have handy to fill in that gap. So if you have, say, if you have a window that opens horizontally, you can get this mounted usually at the base of the, of the window. We're sort of resting on the windowsill. And then you cut yourself a, a piece of the right dimensions to come in like this and, and fill in that gap. So then you're going to have this come indoors and meet the observation hive. And you got, of course, you got to have a good Good junction here. I'm not a great carpenter, but I can kind of manage this to work here. And uh, then this hive will probably be bolted to something very secure. What we oftentimes do is we'll find a, a really heavy table and even go so far as to drill holes for bolts so that you have it really anchored to the heavy table. And then oftentimes we'll put maybe some eyelets up at the top and run wires up to the ceiling or to the walls because this can be kind of top heavy. Um, we actually put one up at a 4-H camp in Kentucky, and I think it was the year 1990. Um, I think it's still there. <laughs> uh, you know, this is with hundreds of kids, probably over a thousand kids every summer come through and look at the observation hive. So you want it really, really solid. And I think there's only been one stinging incident where we had a feeder, and some kid put his fingers on the feeder where there were some bees, and so we had to redesign that a little bit so that it's impossible to to have your fingers um, exposed to the bees like that. It's all pretty much common sense. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, so of course you want a certain amount of level here. Then the other thing to do is think very carefully about where this room is going to be, where you're going to have your hive. Um, uh, first of all, it should be, of course, it's got to be close to a window. Um, you gotta be, a, gotta be a little bit of space there. If it's in your home, then of course you have a lot of freedom to do it exactly as you like. You probably want this on the first floor because otherwise it's a lot of carrying upstairs to get this, this thing up to a second floor. Again, that's, that's your decision, but it's, it's kind of a chore to carry this a long distance. You wanna think about what's outside. I mean, do you have neighbors just living a few feet over in the next house? Or is this a place that where people are not gonna be walking by and, and bothering the bees. So think very much about your neighbors or whoever lives close to the site that you're choosing. Um, that's all, all, in general, all of us that work bees have to think about our neighbors. Um, 
This should, um, we like to have our hives pointed south or east. It's not entirely critical for an observation hive because it's mostly indoors. But um, find a place where you know, you're free of bushes and where you can come in and come to the outside. Imagine this being the wall here, okay, and the window. If you can come to the outside and do what you need to do out here, uh, whether it's trim bushes or, or whatever to make it this accessible to the bees. And this, this can be a little bit shorter. And then you can make it out of other things. Some people use plastic tubes. Uh, those work for bees. Um, a lot of things are, are possible here. This is just the desi design that's easy for me to make. Um, <clears throat> and then another thing you want to think about is um, occasionally, of course, you're going to have to put the bees in to the hive at some point and bring it indoors. And then you're going to also want to uh, probably maintain it occasionally. There might be something that needs to be done. And then most likely in the fall, you're want, going to want to take it down. Most of the time, these hives have a trouble getting through the winter. Um, it's just, mostly just because they can't form a cluster. There's not enough honey. There's not enough bees. So you, typically in the fall, you'll take this apart and, and unite the bees with, with some other hive in some fashion. So in order to do that, of course, you've, this has got to be separated from the runway. And the best thing to do here, and this also is diagrammed in the booklet, is to, is to make design these this connection here so there's two slits, um, one at, on the runway part and one on the hive part, and they're as close together as possible. And then you get something, either a, a piece of uh, metal or plastic or whatever, it's not too critical, so that you can close the exit and the entrance both when you need to. Because on a typical day, you know, bees are always coming and going, and you don't, if you take this apart, you'll have bees all over the place. It'll be a mess. So the first step then is you're going to close, close the door on the hive and close the door on the runway, and so you're going to have a little bit of a traffic jam for a while. The incoming bees will be all backed up here trying to get in, and the outgoing bees likewise will be backed up here. Make sure you design this so it's gonna, everything is going to hold together well while you move the hive. So once you've got this closed and you disconnect the hive and you carry it outdoors, and typically I like to go outdoors and do the work and maintenance right outside of where the runway is, so the straggler bees will be able to find their way easily back into the hive, and there certainly will be straggler bees. And then what's, it's a matter of, of disconnecting probably the transparent side on one side, adding or removing frames, doing what you need to do, putting it all together. There's going to be stragglers on the hive and everywhere else, so you got to brush them off and make sure you get in. You might want to do this with another person the first time just so you kind of keep tabs on everything. And then when you get it back in, you reconnect and make sure this is aligned very carefully. And, um, <clears throat> and then you open the doors and the bees rush in and out and, and the hive kind of settles back. So there's a lot of issues like that that you want to um, consider. And, um, what else here? Another consideration I mentioned here is that not having direct sunlight on the hive, because this is basically like a little greenhouse, and if the sun comes in the window and shines directly on that hive, this can really cook the bees, and, and it'll build up, the heat will build up, and it'll be a major problem for the bees. So don't allow the hive to be exposed to direct sunlight for any extended period. Um, another thing you're going to see happening in the, in the wintertime or in the summertime, I mean, when you've got air conditioning going, there's going to be condensation on the in, inner walls very frequently because the bees are keeping warm and they may be bringing in nectar, they're respiring, everything that living creatures do. And if the room is nice and cool, the air conditioning is going full blast, you're going to have to see this both sides just coated with water. So to, to deal with that, you need to have a fan uh, to pull air, room air, through the hive. And so what we've done is we get these little they call them, you know, little fans you have for computers. You can buy them all sorts of places. They're not very expensive. They're just very small electric fans. It does not have to have, pull a lot of air, just a little bit. And you can mount it up on top if you've got a hole on the top. It's a good way because then it pulls air through the whole hive and gets that, that humid air out. And we found that that works well um, when, uh, when you've got a situation where there can be a lot of condensation. Um, let me think here. Um, you may very well want to have a feeder on the hive. Well, I've, I've mounted one up here, and this is just a little platform that 
has screen over the top, and you mount your bottle, usually like a one-quart bottle or similar, right on the screen, and if the bees are hungry, they should find that pretty quickly. Um, if this is going to be in a public place, you want to be very careful about how you do this sort of feeding because this is a recipe for disaster. If you've got it at home, then you can relax quite a bit. But um, I like to have a feeder up a little bit away from the bottom of the hive because I found that sometimes robber bees can get into the observation hive and discover the feeder and, and rob it out, and the bees in the observation hive are not strong enough really to dominate the feeder, and so you can have that kind of problem. I did. Notice one time we had an observation hive and the, the syrup was getting depleted really fast. I thought, how can this little hive be consuming so much syrup? And then I realized that what was happening is the robbers were coming in and discovering it. That was when the feeder was down lower and it was really easier for them to find. If you put it up higher, it's a little bit more difficult for the robbers to find. But if you've got other bees, hives nearby, be aware that there can be that kind of interaction. And this is always going to be a weak hive. It's never going to have a lot of guard bees. It's never going to be able to defend itself very well. Um, <clears throat> so those are some of the basics. Um, and um, I think what the best thing to do now is to think about the, the good stuff and why are we going to all this trouble. I mean, these, these things are really, really cool. And if you get this set up, especially if it's a place where you can watch it, easily and frequently, if it's in your home, for example. Um, there is a whole lot of behavior in the hive that we don't really see when we open an outdoor hive because we're disrupting the bees. For example, the waggle dances that the bees do to communicate um, food sources with each other, a lot of times that's disrupted when we open a hive. Um, other kinds of behavior, interactions among the bees, the queen, Laying. Sometimes we can see a, a queen laying eggs when we pull a frame out, but oftentimes she goes and runs in the corner and, and we can't really see her. But once things settle down here, you can watch the queen's behavior. Uh, she goes into a cell and specks and comes around and turns around and backs in to lay an egg. You can watch the retinue of bees that surround the queen as they uh, groom here and, and, and take the pheromone off of her body. And then the waggle dances themselves are really cool. What we um, and the booklet, again, explains how to decipher this, and it's also explained in, in other sources. But if you've ever seen this happen, the, a scout bee will come back from searching for food, come back to the hive, and if the scout is successful, she will communicate to other worker bees the location of that food source. And then she does this waggle dance, and um, here we go. I really like this, the places that have chalk. I mean, this is really cool stuff. I'm <laughs> you all have to ask your grandparents about this sometime. They'll tell you what it, what it used to be used for. Um, but what will happen is the scout bee then will do this figure eight dance. So, for example, she will go waggle her, her body like this, and then she'll go around in a circle like this, and then she'll repeat the waggle, and then go around this way, okay? And you do the waggle, and this will go on and on like this. And this is giving a lot of information. The angle of the waggle with respect to vertical, this angle right here, is the angle of the food source relative to where the sun is, okay? So if this is your hive here, and the, um, say the sun is off in this direction, then the bee is waggling this angle to the right of the sun, which would be this angle right here, which is the same as this angle. And this here would be the flowers or whatever they are. This is my, that's my flower there. Um, now if the bee is pointing straight down when she's waggling, that means the, the recruit bees should fly opposite the direction of the sun. If she's waggling, to the left of vertical, that means the bees should fly like 90 degrees to the left from the sun's direction. Now the distance information is in the duration of the waggle, how many seconds. So it's nice if you have a stopwatch, maybe you even have one on stopwatch app or whatever, and so you time the waggle, and then the best thing to do is add the times for 10 waggles and divide by 10. That gives you a, a good average. So if, it's, if the waggle is averaging one and a half seconds, 
then you can refer to a graph that will tell you how far away the food source is. Um, and then what you can do is you can get yourself a map of the area around the observation hive, maybe a few miles around. We actually used to use these topo maps, which have all the contour, but now there's all sorts of, of cool maps that you can use. Considering the bees may be flying several miles from the hive, and then you can figure out on the top of the map exactly where they're indicating. And we did this with some students one time. We got the map up on the wall, and we got a bunch of these little colored stickers. And um, today is Friday, and the bees are, and if, and if you're looking at the map, and you see, okay, and then north is up to the top, and here's the hive. And you say, well, the, a lot of bees are indicating food source over here, okay, and so you can plot the waggles. And then a few waggle dances are going down here, okay. And then next week, you do the same thing. You say, hmm, there's only a few bees going to this site. It must be getting depleted. It's not quite so um, interesting to the bees. So it's just kind of a few dots there. So then you put a different color dot next week to indicate what the, what the, where they're going next week. And then maybe there's they're still going here, maybe there, this is even more attractive, so you're seeing more here, so you can put some um, colored dots there, and, and maybe they've suddenly started going to this place over here because they've discovered some new food. So over a period of days or weeks, you can see how the foragers transition from one food source to another, and this can be kind of cool because then you could realize that your own outdoor hives are doing the same thing. They are um, constantly assessing the bloom out there for miles around. They're constantly coming back to the hive. The scout bees, which is a small minority of the forager bees, are scouts. That's their whole job is to go out there and search. And, um, and to come back and to, um, to tell the others what's going on. Now another thing that, another component of the waggle dance, which you can really see with an observation hive, is the vigor of the dance. And that tells us, or tells the bees, whether it's a really good food source or not really good. If it's a, just, and sometimes you'll see these bees are just waggling with tremendous intensity, which means let's get out there. This is a really good food source, um, and it's probably better than anything else we're trying to get right now. And then you also see some waggle dances that are just kind of wimpy, and that means um, it's not great, you know, but it might be better than nothing. Go out there and, and check it out. So the waggle dances are a way of a very important way of communicating food sources, and the honeybees are unique in this way. Um, not much else in the animal world has this kind of a sophisticated dance. Uh, they do other things too. Um, I will also mention that the, the, the scout bee also shares some food, it's just a drop of, of food so the other bees can understand how sweet it is. Um, and then the, the odor of the bee. The bee has been to a flower that has a particular odor and brings that odor back because she's fuzzy and she has accumulated some of the odor. So the bees that are, recruit bees that are paying attention to the, to the dance, um, they have distance, direction, quality, and odor information. That's a lot of information that really helps them get out there. And then they have a huge competitive advantage over other types of bees that are just randomly searching. They really don't have a clue where, where to go. Um, there's other really cool behaviors too. There's something called um, the vibration signal, which is very commonly seen in observation hives. And what you'll see is one bee, these are all worker bees, of course, one worker bee gets up on the back, on the thorax of another bee and goes like that really quick, and then walks over, finds another bee and goes like that, and walks over and does this again and again. Um, that signal indicates conditions are improving, um, everybody wake up and pay attention to the waggle dances. Okay, for example, if there's been a long rainy stretch and nobody's been out foraging and everybody's just sort of lounging around at home trying to save energy and then suddenly the sun comes out and everything starts blooming, the, the, um, these bees that are doing, doing the vibrating signal are telling the other bees, hey, let's, let's wake up, let's pay attention. And those bees that get that signal then move down to the area where most of the dances are doing, which is usually in the brood nest. So that's a way of getting everybody synchronized. And there's a lot of other behaviors that are really cool to see too. So um, there's that. And of course, you're gonna incorporate all this stuff if you're working with school children or whomever. Um, you can get all this stuff communicated to them too, and that's, that's really fun. And you can, 
They can learn map making skills and how to read graphs and, and all that kind of stuff with this information. You can also train these to sugar water. If, this is especially a good idea when there's a kind of a dearth, when the bees are not actively foraging. Oftentimes it's late summer in certain places, wherever you happen to live, you know there's some times a year when the bees are really kind of struggling to find food. So what you can do is you get yourself a little dish of whatever. Um, sometimes people use these little plastic petri dishes, but it doesn't matter too much. Sugar water, which is about one to one sugar and, and water, and maybe a drop of something with a strong scent, like um, you know, peppermint or lemon or, or anything that you might have in your um, kitchen cabinet. And then what you do is bees are coming and going, you go outside and you set your dish right outside here where um, the bees are coming and going. So they'll find it very quickly. And some of the bees will go over there and oftentimes you have a little screen over the top so they can perch and take a drink and then they'll go back in. And they'll come back out, of course. And then what you do is you start moving the dish away, you know, six inches, a foot, two feet, 10 feet, and, and this just takes some patience, but eventually the bees figure it out, and then they, they start flying to longer and longer distances. And if you want to be really fancy about this, you can take um, a little paint. There are these Posca markers that they sell for marking queens are really good. You can put a drop on the back of a bee as it's drinking. Just if you, it's not hard to do, really, because they're holding still for a few seconds. You can put a drop of, say, white paint on that bee, and then you can watch what happens. This bee is going to come back and, and communicate to the other bees, okay? especially if it's, if it's a time when they really need food. And then you can continue to move this. And when this dance was first discovered, anybody know who discovered the waggle dance? Frisch. Von Frisch, yeah, Carl von Frisch. The only person to receive a Nobel Prize for work pertaining to honeybees, okay? So that was pretty cool. And what von Frisch did, he was the first guy who kind of figured this out. He and his, his um, associates kept moving these dishes farther and farther away, and finally they would get them miles away. I mean, way out there. There's a one picture of somebody way out on a desolate road out you know, in the forest, sitting there in a chair with the feet are there, you know, sitting there waiting for the bees to come. <laughs> and, but that's exactly what they did. And they knew that dish was exactly a certain distance and in exactly a certain direction. And they, you can use different combinations of colors, you know, red and white and green and so forth. And now they actually sell numbered tags too. So you can have green 49 and yellow 21 and all this kind of stuff. So you can do all sorts of, of cool things. But anyway, here comes, you know, yellow 21 and you might have your little um, whatever you're using to talk to your, your friend back here by the hive said, okay, you know, Yellow 21 just left and uh, should be getting back there in about 10 minutes or so. Here comes Yellow 21 and comes up and does the dance, okay, and say, oh, well, they've kind of figured it all out, that it does, in fact, the dance does, in fact, correspond to the distance and direction and, and the quality of the food. And... Um, so that, that was pretty cool. And uh, then they did some more experiments too. Like, for example, if the bees have to uh, fly around a big building, okay, um, let's say you, you know, we're having them fly around one of these really tall buildings and the bees are probably not gonna go up and over. So the bees eventually figure out that, you've, you know, that you train them to go all the way around like that over a period of hours or days. And then the bees, what do they actually indicate? Of course, they can't indicate take a right turn. But what they do do is indicate the direction and distance as if you were flying right through the building. So the recruits have to kind of figure it out. They come up to the building and they say, oh, okay, it must be on the other side of the building. So the recruits basically figure that out and go around. So the bees have a lot of ways of, um, of explaining this sort of stuff. So that's just an example of one thing. Another really fun thing to do that's, that's actually pretty easy is you can put in newly emerged bees into the hive marked with a certain color, okay? And again, you get these Posca markers which come in different colors. And what you do is you go out to your hive, an outdoor hive, and take a frame of capped brood from which the bees are emerging, okay? And this is, you've probably all seen this, you get some brood that's just maturing, and you see the bees are chewing their way out. And what you do is you bring that indoors, <clears throat> and one by one, the bees come out, and they're, at that young age, they can't fly or sting. So it's very easy to, to manage them. I mean, you take each bee and say, okay, Friday, they're all getting the white dot, okay? So you make sure the paint is completely dry 
So you don't want them getting that smeared around. Once it's completely dry and you have a, maybe a hole in the top that's normally screened over and you pop them in and they go in there and they join the colony, okay? And you continue to do whatever you want to do is depending on your patience, but you add in, okay, all the Friday bees have white dots, okay? And you go back on Sunday, say, and say, okay, all the Sunday bees, and the mark on your calendar, okay? Was this July 10th, I think, right? Okay, and then July 12th, they'll be, have green dots, and then July 14th, they'll have blue or whatever, and you keep doing this over time, and then these bees become integrated into the colony, and they do their jobs, and this is how we can learn how the bees change their jobs over time, okay? So we can do, say, okay, here's a bee that's going around and, and looking into pollen cells or looking into uh, brood cells, and this bee is uh, five days old, okay? And say, boy, there's a lot of bees that, are, that have that age that are looking into brood cells. Those must be nurse bees, relatively young bees, okay? And then you see some other bees, you know, in the queen's retinue, and you can see what age they are according to the dots. And, and then eventually, so we know the older bees are those that go out and fly. They're the ones that go out, and the first thing they do is they make an orientation flight. You make these big circles around where they're memorizing landmarks, and after they've done that for a day or so, they settle in and they go out and start foraging and trying to, trying to find the food. So you'll see the older bees, according to this dot system, are able to um, um, come out and, and start doing that job, which is it's also the most dangerous job, too, for as far as the bees are concerned. They can be caught in a storm. If it's a really windy day, they might not get back home. If you ever looked really carefully at bees, like through a magnifying glass, you notice that some of the bees are so old that their wings are tattered. And you can, if you can hold, if you have a bee that you can sort of restrain it and, and move the wings a little bit, you can see that wing margin is really chewed up. And that tells you this bee does not have a lot more miles on its life, because you can imagine it's that, those wings, that's probably one of the things that makes a bee die away from the hive is the, is the wings. Because you figure how many times they flap their wings in a second and then how many hours a day they're flying and it's a, a lot of mileage on those wings. And it stands to reason that there'll be some day, you know, a windy day especially, they, some of those bees just cannot, cannot make it home. So and then if you add in other problems that we have now with diseases and mites and so on, that makes a difference too. So this is, this is a really cool tool. I encourage people to, to, um, try, to try to do this. Um, you can make it or you can buy the parts, put them together. Um, the main issue probably for you is going to be where to actually put it in a place that's going to be appropriate. Now, some people will, will put these you know, in schools, in libraries, where public can do it. And then, of course, you have to be really careful that it's really locked down. But I know of um, some public schools in, uh, in Kentucky, some teachers in public schools that have had permission to actually do this. And they've been very, very interesting to the school kids. One was a middle school in Lexington, and another one was a high school in Louisville. And you know, the first thing the keys, kids do when they come in the classroom is they go right to the hive. And another thing to do is it's kind of nice to not mark your queen, because these kids are really quick at finding the queen bee. They can find it faster than we can usually because their eyes are so good. And then um, they get interested in all this stuff they see. You can also see the bees with different colored pollen coming in and that gives an indication of what kind of flora they're going to. And you might see that the bees are doing one particular dance have one particular color of pollen. So that's another indication of where they might be going. Um, let's see, what else? Um, any questions to this point? Yes. Okay, requeening, um, th this is going to be a hive maintenance deal, or if you have other problems too, um, basically you're going to go in and um, first of all make sure your neighbors aren't mowing their lawn right outside the, the door here, but you're going to go in and you're going to close the two doors with your slots of metal or plastic or whatever, get everything unbolted, and then carry it outside, go out, make sure you don't have to go too far to get to the door and come around and then set everything down Usually I work on, set it down on the grass, and then you get your screwdriver and, and just attach everything, remove the, the plastic or glass, and then you just do the standard requeening procedure um, and, uh, and put everything back together, and then you go in and make sure you got all the stragglers off and so on. So it does take a little bit longer this way, but it's the same procedure, really. It's very much the same. Um, 
I can tell you a couple of stories that are kind of interesting. I, one time I was setting up some observation hives in this one room that I had at my university. And um, <clears throat> it was a summer night, and I was working by myself, and it was getting late. And I got the first one set up with bees from one particular hive. And, uh, and then I got the second one set up, and then the third one was starting to get pretty dark, you know, and I was kind of in a hurry to get the third one set up. And I came back the next day to check on them, and the first two hives were doing fine, but the third one, I had missed the queen. Okay, so the third one was queenless. I had just not seen her, and she was back in the source hive, wherever it was. And I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll have to, you know, get, get that queen and get her in. Well, what happened soon afterwards was that hive number three came down with an incredible case of chalk brood. Um, there had not been any chalk brood in the hive that was visible at all. And which, you know, you could look and through the, through the glass there were all these cells with chalk brood mummy and, and chalk brood had fallen down here and the hive was just really struggling. I thought, wow, what a mess. And um, so what I did, and you can see I have this hole over here on the side, which is handy for a lot of things. I said, well, I'm going to get that queen back in this hive and see what I can do about it. So I had this long cylinder of screen. It's like eight mesh screen, which basically was a queen cage, right? And in one end, I put some queen candy, which is what the bees eat through in a, from a queen cage. You can make up your own queen candy. And put the queen in and put a stopper here. And then there's a little bit of extra space here um, between the second and third frames, and that was deliberate, so that I could actually do this. So I could put, push this long cylinder all the way through as resting on top of the second frame. And I sealed this off, and I left a little space here so that the worker bees could eat through the candy and release the queen, which is what we normally see happen in a hive when we're introducing a queen. Well, it, everything happened fine. The bees ate through the candy. The queen came out. And then all of the chalk brood disappeared. All the bees completely cleared out that chalk brood, and there was not a single trace of it visible in the hive. And that, to me, was a great indication of, of, what, of the significance of the queen and her pheromones and her egg laying and everything, not just on laying eggs. I mean, she just, you know, her pheromone production is enormously important. If I had installed that hive number three correctly, I never would have seen this. See? So this is an example of how mistakes can be really, um, really good kind of mistakes to make, very instructive mistakes. And so then, you know, eventually I pulled that cage out and sealed things up. Um, and it's just, uh, if you can even do this for your own experiment. What does a queenless hive actually look like, you know? And then you can watch them. If they have some young brood, you know, they'll start making queen cells and you can watch that whole process. If you leave a gap and the bees are well fed, they'll start making wax and you can watch that process too. Um, it's almost an unlimited number of things that you can do. Um, is there somebody raising their hand back here? Oh, yes. Okay. What? Uh, you mentioned the air conditioner and the, and the temperature and uh -huh. the condensation, but my question is, if I can control the temperature on the outside of this hive uh -huh. and to make it optimum for yeah. the bees, not me? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Would it, would it actually be brood temperature? Or? It would be pretty warm, yeah. You, I mean, like you say, it would be probably in the 80s. Um, it would be a little bit warmer than you might prefer, but it would certainly be better for the bees because then they wouldn't have this condensation issue. And uh, likewise, in the wintertime, I mean, if you were willing to crank your room temperature up to 85 or so, the bees would be much happier. So other people will put insulation and so forth. But yeah, that's right. So this, this is in the light uh, quite often, and we know that the bees are doing most of their work in the dark. Mm -hmm. Does it also assist if we uh, have a, a shade or a... Yeah. I meant, to, I meant to mention that, right. Surprisingly, if there's just regular room lights, it, the bees get used to it, which is surprising. I had a friend who was part of his studies, he was looking at this, um, this vibration signal. So initially he was working only in red light, which the bees cannot see, to see if that made a difference. And he found that it made no difference at all. The bees actually get used to the room lights perfectly well after they've been installed. Gabe? What uh, race of bees? I haven't really experimented very much. I think all races of bees will do well, um, you know, just whatever is convenient. If you're curious, of course, you could set up one hive with Italians, another one with Carniolans or whatever, and just watch and see how they're different. But of course, they're not going to really come to their full strength when they're confined like this. So you wouldn't quite see as much. Yes? Yeah, yeah you have to be really careful about leaks, jailbreaks, and all that stuff. And, and that's another consideration right here, okay? Um, so yeah, any little thing that lets the bees loose is, it could be a, a huge issue, right? Um, one thing that you'll see is that um, 
The bees, if they're, we've heard some good talks here about propolis, and the, which is very valuable to the bees for disease control, but bees will propolize the area where the, the glass touches the wood, okay? And then you say, oh, I've got to get this side off. How am I going to do it? And then you say, how in the world am I going to get this glass off without breaking it? It's really, sometimes it's really glued in there. And if the propolis is a little bit cool, then it's going to be hard. You say, my goodness, this is, you know, I didn't expect this. Um, what we're going to try this year, if we can, is actually um, have a different way of, of mounting the glass next to the wood. And I meant to bring this with me, but I, at the hardware store, they have this sort of like a strip that you have on windows that accepts the glass through a slot. Anybody know what that stuff is called? It's, um, anyway, what? Maybe, I, I don't know. Um, but anyway, it's not very expensive. You can get it in like four foot lengths. And so we're going to do that. And then also I'm going to take some, some plastic, actually, that comes off of a laminating machine. You know, if you laminate something and if you have a laminating machine, there's always this extra stuff that comes out. You always get a few feet of stuff that you have to throw away. Well, I actually use that stuff sometimes, and I, I cut it in a, like a one-inch slit, and you can lay that in there, and I th I'm going to see if this works, and lay it in there so that the glass will not be actually touching the wood. Okay, so the, of course the bees might propolize the laminate material to the, to the <coughs> glass, but I think it'll be easier to get this whole thing apart if I do that. And so we'll see. That's another, another experiment. Yes? I, I've had a Three-crane observation hive for uh -huh. years. I try to keep them live year-round in there. Uh huh. And are, are on you one side has a cabinet door. Okay. With glass in it, and that works fine. Uh mm -hmm. It's screwed shut, but okay. the screws out it just opens like a door. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for like keeping them warm in the winter, is that what you mean, or, or? No, I mean, as far as working with them. Oh, for working with them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. It's if, usually stuck with some beeswax. Yeah. Right on that on that. that yeah, so basically you just mount some, some doors here. That, and if they're made just right, that would work very well. Yeah. Right. I kind of like to be able to see on both sides of my hive. So that's why. Oh, it's glass. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, well, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, you could have a, basically have some hinges on one side, and, and then you just sort of open it up. It's, you're going to still have to pop them loose a little bit. But. Yeah, that, that's basically, we, we've got one in a, in a heritage farm. Mm -hmm. It's plain glass on one side, and, and then, then the hinge door to glass on the other. So okay. All we got to do, we have a lock on it, so the kids can't open. Yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. And most yeah. of the time, it's pretty easy to get open. Okay. They will propolize it. I think I bought, I bought it from Better Bee. Okay. Years. Okay, that's good. Yeah, good idea. Yes. My daughter wants observation hive for four H project. Uh huh. One week. Okay. Prepared. Yeah. So is there a problem with just taking two frames and putting it in a hive and have it totally sealed for that one well, week and what, it can't get out at all? Yeah, what, what some people do is they, at the end of the day when everybody's gone, they take the observation hive home and let the bees fly, okay? And, uh, and then when it's time to go back to the fair, close it up, because you can miss some flying bees, of course. You might actually want to close it off after dark so that the next morning you can take it into the fair and at least then they get a chance to, to fly out. I'm not sure what kind of time they would be available or how far away you live from the fair and all these sorts of logistical things. But some people do try to take the observation hive um, from the fair to a place nearby where they can do some flight. Um, but you know, bees do not like to be confined for long periods. So that's another thing I'll tell you that's another interesting trick is to um, is actually have two observation hives and you swap them out. Um, I know somebody that was maintaining observation hive at the, um, I think it was the Nashville City Zoo, and he had two identical observation hives, and, and whenever he needed to change, you know, he would just bring in one and take out the other, and they, they would all connect perfectly, and it would just take him a few minutes, and then at home he would do all the maintenance that was necessary and so forth. Um, so that would be another possibility to think about is actually have two and, and swap them, okay? A little bit more work, but, um, and something, I don't know how far away is the fair from where you live? 15 miles. That's not too bad, yeah, that's not too bad. Yes? Have you ever modified a full-size hive to have an observation window? Um, you're talking about like a standard box. Uh, I have not, um, I'm, I know some people like to do that, and they like to put webcams in there and all those sorts of things like that. Um, 
The thing is, the, the outermost part of the hive is probably the least interesting. Um, to my, at least to me anyway, because generally the queen's not going to be on the very outside. Um, you're not going to see the waggle dances. You're not going to see the brood rearing stuff. Um, you're going to probably see some bees that might be in there putting in honey, um, so that would be nice. But um, to me, I want to see what's going on in the center of the hive. That's, you know, that's just what's interesting to me. So I know that some people do that, though. Yeah. Um, Let's see, what time are we supposed to? Okay. Oh my goodness, it's exactly 12.15, how about that? <laughs> I'll be around here a little bit if people want to ask more questions or make comments and observations and so forth, but I think it might be time for lunch. <laughs>